Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. If you're walking down the right path and you're willing to keep walking, eventually you'll make progress. Here's a quote from Barack Obama, the 44th President of the United States of America. I thought this was an appropriate quote for our discussion today on the upcoming US election. A contest between Barack Obama's Vice President Joe Biden and his successor, Donald Trump. And our guest, a former senator and an expert on American politics, will guide us in navigating the battle for the soul of America. Our guest today is Stephen Loosley AM, who served as Senator for New South Wales in the Australian Parliament during the Hawke and Keating governments, where he chaired both the Joint Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, and the Senate Regulations Committee. Stephen is now the Deputy Chair of Talis Australia and a Director of O'Connell Street Associates. He served as Chair of the Woomera Prohibited Area Advisory Board and is the immediate past Chair of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, where he is now a Senior Fellow. Hello and welcome to a special episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you could apply to your own life. I am your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blenheim Partners, the number one research-led executive search and board advisory firm. In what many will argue is the most important US election in our lifetime, today we discuss the state of play, the candidates and their respective parties, their platforms and policies, and where it will be won and lost. In the spirit of democratic political discourse, to provide a balance in a conversation with a supporter of the Democratic Party, I'll be providing commentary and opposition, presenting a Republican or pro-Trump stance. Looking forward, we will continue the conversation with Stephen after the election to review the key moments, where it was ultimately won, what the future of America will look like, the ramifications for the world, and whether Stephen's prediction was correct. Please note that the views and opinions expressed by Stephen Loosley in this podcast are his own and do not necessarily reflect those of the organizations he's involved with. So sit back and enjoy the battle for the soul of America. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. We're here today to talk about the US election. Why is it such a great fascination for you? Well, I suppose Gene and Bernie loosely have a lot to do with it, God bless them. Um, a working class family, mum and dad uh, always were of the view that education was of critical significance. That was the way out for working class kids. Yep. So books were often favoured as uh, gifts at birthdays in particular. In one year, I was nine or ten. Mum and dad gave me a, a book, and I'll not forget it, from the How and Why Wonder series. And it was on the American Civil War. Okay. Now, the beauty of the book was it uh, opened up an entire universe to a very young mind. And some of it was done in colour. And Australia was a black and white society in the late 50s, early uh, 60s. But the Americans, of course, were already moving to colour on, uh, on television. So the Civil War struck me, even at that young age, as really having a consequence for the entire world. Can you imagine, for example, uh, in 1917, if there had been two Americas, if there'd been the United States, Washington, D.C., its capital, the Confederate States of America with Richmond, Virginia as its capital, yeah. and 
what may well have happened had the union not prevailed in 1865 was that there would have been several Americas and global politics would have been very, very different. So American history, American politics, American culture struck me at that very young age as, as having an astonishing consequence, which it still does today. Now, the presidential election, November 3, 2020, Greg, that's a global ballot. Yeah. It's just that only citizens of the United States, quite properly, have the franchise, but it is a ballot with global consequences. On that, Stephen, then what should we be thinking about? And just in reading the papers and flicking on the TV, reading the scribes, about the ramifications for who's going to win? This is uh, an important election for America's allies. You have a, a circumstance um, globally that we're still benefiting from the Paz Americana that Harry Truman began to construct in 1946 after the Second World War. That dual and related concept of uh, international law, international agreements, international instruments. Uh, the United Nations is the classic example of, of course, coupled with American alliances that guarantee the global commons and effectively preserve the peace. The best example of that has been NATO. Yeah which for some 40-odd years guaranteed the peace in Europe. And when you bear in mind that Europe had fought a civil war between 1791 and 1945, that is no mean achievement of itself. Eventually, the Soviet empire collapsed. The boundaries of Europe were extended in terms of the EU, were extended in terms of the NATO agreement, and a greater stability has prevailed and a greater prosperity has prevailed in our part of the world. The US alliances with Japan, Korea, with Australia and others have served a very, very similar purpose in terms of preserving the global commons and, and ultimately guaranteeing the peace, firstly against the Soviet Union and its derivatives at a more recent times against other aggressive powers. What headline would you give this this election? Well, it's a battle for the soul of America. There's no question about that. I mean, Donald Trump, and I'll need to guard my words carefully here, Donald Trump may have been a, a mistake in terms of being elected four years ago. I think he's reflective of larger political undercurrents, not only in, uh, in North America, but in, in Europe. But Trump's election may be written off by historians as a mistake if he's a one-term president. If he's re-elected, that says a very great deal about the United States. So can you talk us through each of the parties? For those out there who are learning about US politics, what do they stand for? How are they structured? And am I voting for the president? Am I voting for the party? How does, how does that really differ? Well, it's a mix. It's, it's not only a, a vote for the president, the vice president, of course, but going down the ticket, there are United States senators up for ballot. There are congressmen and women. There are mayors right down to local sheriffs. The Americans have, have always had the view from the time of the Revolutionary War that you solve a problem politically by having a ballot, having an election. It even went to the stage of some of the officers in Washington's Revolutionary Army had been elected by their troops. Right, okay. So you have this as the clearinghouse of, of their democracy. Now, sometimes that has unfortunate consequences. I mean, the term of the House, for example, is yep. two years. Far too short. People never stop running for office. People never stop having to raise money for the next campaign. So it, it has uh, unforeseen consequences in some respects, but American electorate does pride itself on making judgments from the president right through to local office bearers, which it, uh, for Australians traveling in the US is often quite fascinating because you see judges being elected yeah. and judges running for office. Yeah. So it is a vast roiling electorate. Now, the parties are not as significant as they are in terms of their discipline in Australia, though that's tending to erode even, uh, even Australia. The Democrats traditionally have been the party of the centre-left. Mm -hmm. the party of organised uh, uh, labour, the party of minorities. Now, there's a lot of change that's occurred yep. in the last half century or so where a, a, fr a friend of mine who served in, in key roles in uh, various democratic administrations said openly to me last time I was in the US, we are a party of the coasts. 
we are a party of the northeast and the west coast, and uh, you'd say the state of Illinois on the on the on the Great Lakes. Uh, we are a party of the the coasts. Now, once upon a time, that was not true. Of course, for, for Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman as presidents, that long period of democratic administrations from 1932 to 1952, to be more precise, 33 to 53, the Democratic Party was dominant in the South, absolutely dominant in the South, which is wow. now in large measure a Republican preserve. That's changing a little bit of more recent times uh, too with greater numbers of Hispanic voters and greater enrollments of African Americans. Um, yeah. So, so there's this shift. The Republican Party is traditionally the party of American business, Customarily, it's been the party of American internationalism and a preparedness to lead. And you see that, say, with the Reagan and Bush presidencies. That's really come to an end with Donald Trump to, to a flat stop. In terms of the current president, as listeners would be aware, appears to be more comfortable in the presence of people like President Xi of China or President Putin of Russia rather than democratic leaders and allies with a capital A, like Chancellor Merkel or President Macron or one or two British prime ministers or current prime minister of Canada. So for allies, this is a very important election. Look, the United States can outlast another term of Donald Trump. But Richard Nixon once observed that the US doesn't need a president for domestic affairs. It needs a president for foreign policy, for defence and national security. And critically, as Nixon understood, and as most recently James Mattis, one of Trump's senior yes. cabinet ministers who resigned in something of a uh, of a dispute with the president, made clear allies are force multiplies for the US. Force multiplies mean you can do a lot more without the US having to commit the vast resources that might otherwise be necessary. And that's particularly significant in areas such as the East China Sea, Taiwan Strait, yep. the South China Sea, the Korean Peninsula and the like. So critically important for us. Yes, it is. If I look at the Australian relationship with the United States yep. is generally very sound. And it, it is that way because Australia has long-term friends in a great many places. And we don't rely entirely on the relationship with the White House. Although the relationship with the president is good, the relationship with the vice president is very good. Yep. A lot of friends in the Congress, in the House and Senate, a lot of friends in the administration, a lot of friends in the country at large. And that's largely because Australia hasn't been involved in major disputes with the US as the occasional ruckus over trade or something, tariffs or something like that. But it's bipartisan in Canberra and it's bipartisan in Washington. And our political parties, both sides, have worked hard at the relationship for a very long time. Stephen, what is the actual power that the US president has compared to the rest of government? The interesting thing about the powers of the presidency is that the founding fathers, and they were males, of course, had one overriding objective, and that was they never wanted to see another King George. The success of the, the Revolutionary Armies uh, meant uh, that they could draw up a constitution and a governmental system of a clean sheet of paper. So they made sure the powers were diffused between the House and the Senate in terms of the legislature, the House initially being thought more important than the Senate. And the courts tended to be something of an, of, of an afterthought, but they became much more significant after the constitutional judgment in Marbury and Madison. And the, uh, the presidential powers were circumscribed, but the key power is to be commander in chief of the uh, uh, American Armed Forces, so at beginning US Army, US Navy. That's right, yeah. Now, that becomes very, very significant during the Civil War, where Lincoln eventually, through a chain of command, but Lincoln effectively becomes the warlord. And the army effectively responds to uh, presidential determinations. And you see Grant and Sherman and others yeah much more committed to the president and to the president's perspective than some of the earlier leaders of the US Army, such as George McClellan and so on. There's a shift yep. occurs there. So by the time of Franklin Roosevelt and the Second World War, there is no question 
about whose ultimate determination is going to decide American uh, policy, foreign policy, defence policy, policy in the field. And the great example of that is Harry Truman's decision to use the atomic weapons um, against Japan. The right of veto. Is it often used? It's, it's used differently by a different presidents. Sometimes, occasionally, sometimes the threat of a veto is enough. But it's an important check in their, in their system. It means that Congress and the president have to uh, sit down and sort something out if it's something long term in the Republic's interest. And it's often a, a situation of, of controversy over budget measures and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of public debate. The veto power, I don't think, has been used to the point of abuse by American presidents. I think it's, it's valuable to simply have it in the, in the locker, as Paul Keating would say, to have it as a shot in the locker. Okay. Stephen, can you give me a bit of an insight into where both parties are at? Now, first thing is the Democrats. Are they going more to the left? The Democrats have shifted a little bit to the left uh, during the, uh, the Trump administration. There's no question about that. Senator Bernie Sanders' strong performance in some of the primaries has meant that the ultimate victor had to in terms of the, the platform. Mm -hmm. So that has occurred. And there are some issues that are, are really crying out uh, to be addressed in terms of health care and so on and so forth. Is yeah. Medicare for all the answer? Probably not. But you have a, a circumstance in which there are gaps in the system. So it, it's going to be in all probability, if there's a democratic administration, Medicare for all who need it. A, uh, an extension of the, the system, bearing in mind that it was Truman who first ventured into the field of universal health care in the late 1940s, and the American Medical Association condemned it as socialised medicine. The debate hasn't moved a long way since then. It was Lyndon Johnson who moved decisively and who was president on, on health care. So it has a long history in the, uh, in the US. The new Green Deal yep. is there. In, uh, in play as well. Some of the people who are seen as, as rising stars, uh, such as uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, push the party to do more. In terms of- Very uh, left, very in, left. In terms of American, well, she's a democratic socialist and yeah. she's, she's open about that. And I must say, she's grown a little as a Congresswoman in, in my view, but we'll, mm -hmm. see, we'll see how her career unfolds. The circumstance of an American election, though like an Australian election, is you're winning the middle ground. If you're winning the middle ground, then in all probability you win the election. You can basically say the Democrats will take the northeast of the United States, you know, from New York to Massachusetts and so on, Illinois, and will take in all probability the entire west coast, California, Oregon, Washington, quite possibly Nevada. They've been successful there as well of recent times. So given the Republicans will take much of the South, the mountain states and the plain states, it means the election is decided in the Midwest and the upper Midwest and crucial states that are being contested, North Carolina, Florida, possibly Georgia, Arizona, possibly Texas. But mm. it means a handful of states ultimately are going to determine the election because of the electoral College. Is that the battleground states? Is that what that, that means? That's, that's normally what the pundits call them, yes. Yeah. So we're talking the ones that are really contested uh, routinely or will be again. Florida is, is one. Uh, you have Ohio and Pennsylvania, uh, Wisconsin and Michigan. And what are the Americans voting on? Law and order and the economy versus Well, it, it depends. The, the Republicans have almost become a cult grouped around Donald Trump. And don't take my word for it. Just look at the speakers at their convention. I, 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 I mean, am, I think the I? entire Trump family is speaking. They are. And I cannot yep. remember this uh, happening uh, previously. I know Hunter Biden spoke for his father and Dr. Jill Biden spoke for her husband, but it was a much more diverse range of, uh, of speakers. So the, the interesting evolution is going to be the Republican Party post-Trump. Uh, if Trump is defeated or if he serves another term and then retires, I'm guessing that he becomes a serious threat to Fox News by having his own 
TV network. Yep. I'm just guessing that's where he's going because he has to have limelight. He must have limelight. And it's a terrible thing in politics when people leave. They suffer limelight deprivation and it's painful to watch. The circumstances now that the the Republican Party is in essence the the party of Trump. Didn't one of the delegates from Montana say we call the state Trump Tana? You know, was proud of the fact that everyone had five guns in their home. I mean, it's but, but that's the Americans. We're looking from a different angle. We are, and we shouldn't think that we're the same. No, we shouldn't think that we're the mm -hmm. same. They have a lot of similarities with us, and we have a lot of things in common. Very positive things, but they're different. So, if I'm an American. What are the key things I'm looking to vote on? I think we're looking at Donald Trump as president. Yep. It's a referendum on Trump in part. That means it's a referendum on COVID, the administration's handling of, uh, of COVID. Yep. It's a, a referendum on who is best equipped to reboot the economy yep. and bring it back. I say again, healthcare is an issue there. It's in the courts again at the moment. There are different efforts to dismantle Obamacare to give it its proper title, the Affordable Care Act. So that's going to bring it back in focus come November. The interesting thing, I think, from listeners' point of view is to bear in mind, it's only a couple of weeks away, it's not November 3, the Americans start voting. No, this is, yep, go on. So it's, it's going to be a reflection on the respective candidates and the respective conventions and the respective party perspectives. Most people have awarded marks to the Democrats for, for their virtual convention. Vice President Biden spoke very well. President Obama knocked it out of the park as usual. So they appear to be a united force going into this election. They were not in 2016. And Joe Biden doesn't carry some of the problems that Hillary Clinton was carrying in terms of voter estimation or, or lack of it. And uh, uh, Well, we haven't seen Joe in the debates yet, Stephen. No, well, we have actually. We have oh, no, not against not against well, not against Trump. No, come but on. people people said well against uh, Sarah Palin, for example. How would he go? Well, he did he did well enough that she yeah. went nowhere. Yeah, and uh, again against Paul Ryan. I mean, again, he won the debate comfortably. So I don't think people need uh, be concerned on the Democratic side too much about that. I reckon it's going to open up, Stephen. Well, I think I think there's a lot of questions about. What firstly, about a what about a wager on that? Yeah, okay, I'm happy to do that. I, th I my concern is, and I think a lot of people's concern is, obviously where he's at mentally. He's only going to be a one term president. So whether we've got one term for both of them, effectively. So therefore, how how important is the number two? Well, number the two, the the number two carries great uh, significance, and Kamala Harris would be front runner to succeed a Biden president. Yeah. Not a certainty, by the way. There might be other people who are interested too. So a, a lot of interest in her campaign. I actually think uh, Senator Harris gets under the president's skin. I agree with that. And during the campaign, it's almost certain we will see a thermonuclear tweet, a real Twitter storm from Donald Trump when she says something about him, we've only got to look at the way he reacts to Nancy Pelosi. And he has a problem with women of color. You see his references to the squad, the squad of four Democratic Congress women. And I think that's going to be an interesting element in the uh, in the campaign. They're also very progressive. So maybe he's, yes. maybe he's tackling them on their, when on their, last, on their thinking. When last I looked, that was not a crime. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, why are we sitting here observing the U.S. election? And you look at Nancy Pelosi, what is she, 80 years old? Mr. Trump, 72. Mr. Biden will be older if he, if he won before. He's 70, 70, be 78 yes. when sworn in. And Stan, Which is Danny Hoyer, from memory, is 80 or 81, too. The American political class at the moment so has, what's not, going on? has not renewed itself. Well, why is that? You have a look of... Relatively recent times, Barack Obama was a very young president, though. There is always a need in politics to regenerate and renew, and sometimes the parties fail. That being the case, I remember this comment being made about John McCain when he ran for president. I didn't think it was fair at the time. I don't think it's fair in Joe Biden's 
case either. But there is an argument for American renewal, and that's got to come out of not only out of the House and the Senate, it's got to come at state level too, where the Republicans are dominant, uh, but are being challenged more effectively by Democrats in gubernatorial races and races for the legislature and so on and so forth. But there's a strong case for renewal. The American governing class at the moment is getting to be too old. Let me ask you a couple of tough questions. Joe Biden, how long has he been in politics for? Oh, he had six terms in the US Senate, something like that. He's been there for decades. Okay. What's he done? What's his key things he's done? And why would I vote for him? Well, Freddie Daly would say survival is the key result there. The reason that you vote uh, for Joe Biden is the same reason that I respect Gerald Ford, who restored dignity and integrity to the White House after Richard Nixon. That's the overwhelming reason. And the other day I was listening to um, an interview with John Bolton about his book, The Room yep. Where It Happened, which is well worth reading, I, I might add. And he just talked about a Biden administration. He didn't say he was going to vote, vote for Biden. A Biden administration would bring greater predictability to American policymaking, foreign and defence policy and the like, greater stability. And that is important. So I'm thinking if you want a president who doesn't turn the fire hose on for untruths every morning, you probably look elsewhere than Donald Trump and the best one on offer is Joe Biden. And the interesting thing is the, the lack of third party candidates who are serious or prominent this time. It's really going to be an election where the two parties contest. Interesting take. We don't have the Ross Perot's or anything in that regard, do we? No, and they have a, a, an enormous impact. Uh, George Wallace had an enormous impact as a third party candidate. Teddy Roosevelt had an enormous impact in 1912 as the bull moose candidate. But that's absent this time. That's absent. Who's the better campaigner? There's no question that Donald Trump is a very effective campaigner. But where are his campaign weapons? His principal campaign weapon is the mass rally. Yeah, hasn't got him at the moment. Where he, uh, he, he speaks to the base and he abuses the media and uh, then listens to the Rolling Stones. You can't always get what you want. As hey, it's a fake, the it's a fake news media there, Stephen. <laughs> Look, a simple fact of the matter is Trump has been denied his principal campaign weapons, which are rallies and press conferences where uh, abuse is the norm. Um, that's the, the currency. Now, Vice President Biden, on the other hand, has been hit on the backside by a rainbow in terms of being able to campaign as he chooses, as he sees fit. Out of the bunker. From a basement in, his, in the family home in Wilmington, Delaware. Yep. Now, in January, I went out to Iowa, to the Caucasus, to the Democratic Caucasus, and I went out to a little place called Waukee, which is about half an hour out of Des Moines. And look, the ice and snow were the dominant features in the, the landscape. It was a small gymnasium, a crowd of a couple of hundred people, and the entire Washington Press Gallery seemed to be there. I walked straight into E.J. Dion from the Washington Post, for example, whom I've known through the Australian-American dialogue for years. So it, it was interesting. Now, I thought the vice president was a bit rusty. He was very measured, but I thought he was a bit rusty. He did get in the best line I heard during the primaries, and that's to say that Donald Trump seemed more like George Wallace than George Washington, which went down uh, quite well with the crowd. But I thought he wasn't hitting the ball, as we'd say in a cricket game or a tennis game. Well, what would Trump call him? Sleepy Joe? He's, well, that, that's part of the, the Trump lexicon. I wonder if it's still as effective as it was, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Yep. But we'll see. Simple fact of the uh, the matter is, the vice president picked up his game when Representative uh, Jim Clyburn endorsed him in South Carolina. That mm -hmm. was a turning point. Yep. And African Americans rallied to the standard because they want to see Trump beaten. Overwhelmingly, they want to see Trump beaten. And in particular, do you really, do you really generational. Believe that? Do you really believe that? Oh, no question. He raised their employment stats to the highest they've ever been. African American communities want to see Trump beaten. Full stop. That is interesting. Well, have, have a look at the polls. Have a look at the polls amongst African-American communities. Yeah, but I looked at the polls last time last time around when Hillary was actually trying to be celebrating that morning. They got it wrong. Yeah, the Clinton campaign got wrong the Midwest and the upper Midwest in terms of the so-called blue wall. The person who got it right was Bill Clinton. 
who said to uh, the, the campaign, look, we have to do more Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and so on. They thought, you know, that Bill was out of touch. They were the ones who were out of touch. And it was working class whites who shifted to, to Trump. Yep. Can Trump hold them? That's, that's the question. But African-American communities turned out in, in force. In, it's a great saying in Florida where um, church communities go to church in the morning and go and vote. Yep. And some Republicans in Florida have tried, actually tried to stop that by closing polling stations and a voter suppression effort. But it's called taking our souls to the polls. And the turnout, the turnout will be enormous. And uh, African Americans, by and large, want to see Trump defeated. At any rate, the point that I was making, hmm. Joe Biden lifted his game appreciably. And the speech he gave to the convention, I thought, was very good. And if you look at the response about the place, it was very positive. It's only he, the first speech, he exceeded, he exceeded expectations. It's only the first speech. Yes, but the He's next speech is always important. Yep. You build upon the previous one. Let's see, I Believe guess, me, I'm speaking from experience here. Yeah, let's see if he can. By mm -hmm. the way, the worst presidential speaker since Andrew Johnson is Donald Trump. Have you ever heard him deliver a speech? Mount Rushmore, maybe. Have you ever heard him yeah. deliver a speech? That's in the uh, in the top tier of presidential speeches. No, I, I agree with you there, but do you think he's a good communicator to the common person? He speaks to his base. Now, the interesting thing about the base is it hovers around the high 30s. There's nothing unusual in American politics. So, what, sorry, uh, what is the base that. then? What do you mean by that? Well, the base is essentially those who will vote for Trump even when he's seen shooting someone on the Avenue of the Americas in New York City, and he boasts about that. And you know what? That's true. Now, I myself classify myself as a yellow dog Democrat, okay? okay? That's a Texas Democrat who votes the ticket even when it's led by a yellow dog. In the history of the Texas Democratic Party, that's actually happened. So you wouldn't swing? So that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> uh, there are Republican presidents whom I've admired greatly in the yep. history of the United States. It's difficult to go past someone like Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln yeah. or Theodore uh, Roosevelt. Uh, for example, Ronald Reagan had unquestioned values, and so it goes. But no, essentially a Democrat. Now, people are going to vote for Trump come hell or high water. That's the base. The point okay. is, I was going to make is this. When the appalling Senator Joe McCarthy was headed towards drunken oblivion and was being censured bipartisan by the U.S. Senate, 35% of the American electorate still supported him. That's the sort of block that Trump has. Yeah, right. Okay. Postal votes. Mail-in voting, I'm all for it. Why? Isn't it open to fraud? Because it's an effective way of making sure the franchise is maximised. You make In a democracy, you should make voting as accessible as possible. The history of mail-in voting in the United States is there's almost no evidence at all of fraud or foreign interference and the like. And the Republicans use it just as much as Democrats, for crying out loud. So, I mean, Trump having failed, and for a Trumpeteer like yourself, so you should, <laughs> Not you should, th you should think about the this. Argument. You should think about this. <laughs> Trump failed to postpone the election, which has been set in place by the Congress since 1845. Yep. He then uh, uh, doubled down on mail-in voting. He said, this is going to be an election which is rigged. Yep. All he's doing is he's putting a series of Russian dolls up on the mantelpiece. In the event that he loses, he's got excuses. The same way he said that three million illegals voted for Hillary Clinton last time. And there's no evidence of that at all. It's another reason why Biden appeals to some people. That's why Governor John Kasich you know, died in the wool Republican and endorsed him at the convention, amongst others, and you know, very respected Republicans like uh, General Colin Powell, simple fact of the matter is yeah. you actually want a president who makes policy or argues policy on the basis of evidence. You know, facts, not what, what was Kellyanne Conway's expression, alternative facts? I mean, <laughs> you'd laugh if it was, wasn't so serious. These people are in the White House. All right. Now, for our audience out there, what is the Electoral College? And what is the Electoral Council? Well, While we're having this discussion, how does it all work? Well, the Electoral College is, is born of a determination similar to that which produced the Australian Senate, and that is you don't 
uh, want to have a, a circumstance where the big states simply yeah, okay. dominate. Yep. So you apportion uh, the uh, uh, votes on the, the basis of the representation in the Congress. That means, for example, that California, which is the largest state, I think it's 55 electoral college votes at the moment. Texas is something like 38. New York and Florida is 29 apiece, and so it goes. So you have the number of House seats plus the two Senate seats. You then add the District of Columbia three seats to uh, to make sure the residents of D.C. have a uh, voice, and you come up with uh, 538 from memory. So it's 270 to win. It means that uh, no single state or cluster of states can uh, dominate, and the smaller states uh, have at least three votes. You also have a circumstance in which some of the states uh, split the votes on the basis of results. In most circumstances, it's winner take all. So uh, you can have a candidate who wins the popular vote but loses in the Electoral College, as with Hillary Clinton. By the way, I make the point, the Republicans really did not campaign much at all in states like New York and California. So that that vote for Hillary is a little misleading, but she did win the popular vote uh, overall. Trump won the Electoral College. He's the president. That's their law. Marching down the street, Black Lives Matter. What's What's the feeling in the United States at the moment? There are various responses ranging from the, uh, the couple in St. Louis who went out with guns and appeared at the convention through to people who say, well, certain things have to change uh, with respect to policing and police powers and the uh, and the like. And of course, since we had George Floyd's death, we had a number of other uh, deaths of, uh, of African-Americans. So I suspect the issue is on the agenda, but it's perceived in different ways in different places. Does it have a, an impact? Well, it's going to depend a lot on the campaign itself mm. and what happens during the uh, during the campaign. Personally, I think uh, Joe Biden needs a sister soldier moment. A sister soldier was a New York City rapper, early 90s, whom Bill Clinton rebuked for some remarks she'd made during the campaign, put some distance between himself as a Democratic candidate for President 92 and some of the uh, more militant uh, elements on the on the margins of politics. I think Biden probably needs a sister soldier moment. Hillary Clinton did not have one. She had, um, she had opportunity and she didn't put distance between herself and some people out on the margins. So I think Vice President Biden probably needs to do that to make it clear people who are trying to burn down courthouses don't represent the future of the Democratic Party so why or him. He, well, why hasn't he come out and said anything? Because everything, to happen? everything is carefully calibrated in their politics. So I think it's going to uh, come down to uh, uh, to an uh, appropriate moment and an appropriate circumstance. And defunding the police forces? Is well, he said no to that. Pelosi hasn't said no to it. Has uh, the Speaker introduced a bill onto the floor of the House to support it? I don't think so. Sometimes in, in American politics, they send a signal like that. It's like Jack Kennedy ringing uh, a Mrs. A King when Dr. Martin Luther King was in jail. Yeah, right. And he sent a signal by making that phone call as to where his sentiments were on, uh, on civil rights. Richard Nixon, who actually had a better record on civil rights in, in some respects uh, as the Republican uh, vice president, having served in the US Congress, did not make the phone call, and that was a, a critical error, a critical error. Wrong wrong thing and wrong impact. Stephen, the economy. Surely that's going to be an enormous battleground. Oh, James Carville's right. It, is the economy stupid? There's no question about that. It is a huge battleground, but the question will be who is best equipped to rebuild. So the Democratic uh, slogan, and I have trouble with this, is Build back better, I think. Build back better. That's positioning the party uh, for that. And uh, a Trump can claim, well, I produced an economy which was very buoyant. Yeah, it was. Very vigorous. Yep. There's no question about that. So you so you give him ticks for that? Yes, I do. Um, I, I disagree with the way it was done in, in some respects, but no question that the American economy was very buoyant. Yep. Um, it's now really in the, the doldrums and 
partly that's a consequence of the absolutely chaotic administration response to COVID where, I mean, we won't go into, you know, people injecting themselves with bleach and that kind of thing. I mean, I just leave that to historians. The simple fact of the matter is federal government had no comprehensive response in the US. I give Scott Morrison marks and the Premier's marks. They formed the National Cabinet. Overwhelmingly, Australian response has been bipartisan. It seems to be fracturing at the moment, but it's been bipartisan. And it's been very effective. And you had general agreement between the federal government and the states and territories. Not so in the US. So different states have been doing different things and different states have been arguing with cities. I mean, the state of Georgia, for example, yeah. tried to clamp down on its own cities for trying to mandate masks. I, mean, I find that close to lunacy. Yeah. And then you have people turn up in a, in a state house with AR-15s. What are they going to do? Shoot the virus? I mean, it's just been a patchwork of, of crazy uh, efforts and lack of efforts on, on the ground in a lot of places. And of course, this notion that the virus was actually a hoax, you know, which has been uh, perpetuated on some right-wing media. I mean, there was a, a, a case the other day, a doctor in Texas talking about a, a patient who was dying of COVID who said, I thought this was a hoax. I guess it's not. Yeah, right. Yeah, and you have lots of examples of that. I mean... I don't think outside the the extreme in our politics here, I don't think anybody said this virus was a hoax at any stage. But in the US, there's a lot of that. Look, hoax is a, a popular word in some quarters in American politics, and it's pushed as part of the conspiracist response to uh, to political developments, which aren't necessarily understood. QAnon is the classic case. There are others. Uh, QAnon uh, published the shameful claim that there was a Washington pizza place that was running for Hillary Clinton or with Hillary Clinton, a child sex trafficking racket. And a fella turned up with a rifle to shoot up the place. That's right, yeah. I saw that, now, yeah. fortunately, the police got him. But I mean, this is the kind of, uh, of conspiracy theory. Now, QAnon has been in, uh, effectively endorsed by Donald Trump. He said to people who love their country and they like me... And I heard one of the Trump sons talking favorably about QAnon. Now, the QAnon fits into this hard right of the Republican Party, the cult around uh, Donald Trump. So you can explain anything by saying it's fake news. You know, lots of things in the uh, in the brief history of the Trump administration have just been dismissed as as fake news. For example, some would say the impeachment was simply fake news. Uh, now, the word hoax is used. Russia was a hoax. This is the interesting thing. Now that the, the din has died down, now that it's quiet on the Western Front, the United States Senate said that Russia did intervene in the 2016 election. And this was a, but, bipartis but not, but not this was the, a bipartisan but, finding. Yes, but not in the way that it was presented. We now, you now got the situation where the FBI are under investigation. Comey's under investigation. Where is Hillary, Comey? Hillary's where is under Comey? investigation. That's, where is Comey under investigation? Lindsey Graham came out seeking to subpoena Comey, Rice, Clapper, and Brennan. They were going to see if they could get some indictments on that. Well, that's very process. different to but being it's, investigated it's early. by it's the early. FBI. None of that will go anywhere. You don't think so? so? No. no. So, the, so just, the fake dossier won't that's go just, anywhere? That's just, well, the Steele dossier. Yep. Well, the Steele dossier is old enough to vote. Five or six years old right now, but it includes Hillary Clinton, Page, and Strzok from the FBI, and the former head of the CIA, Brennan. In some counties in the US, that's old enough to vote. Uh, circumstances being what they are, that's just em embroidery. I've just finished a marvellous book yeah. by Christopher Buckley. It's a great satire. He wrote Thank You for Smoking several years ago. It's a marvellous book and film. This one's called Make Russia Great Again. And in one of the early scenes, Trump summons the Russian ambassador and berates him in the Oval Office for Russian bots not doing enough to assist his re-election. Now, you can only have a satire like that in which there's an understanding that reality is not a thousand miles away. Uh, Make Russia Great Again is a wonderful satire on current US politics. And what Buckley understands is to be successful in satire, you simply take reality and twist it half a notch. Are we going to have the three debates? 
Probably yes. And there'll be a vice presidential debate. So okay. uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity for Americans to make up their minds. And by the way, a lot of people do make up their minds watching the debates. Hmm. So bearing that in mind, in your opinion, who's going to get the message across better between Biden and Trump in the debates? Well, what message is Trump going to push? Am I asking the question? It's a question. Well, he's going that, to talk about the economy. It's a question that befuddles me because there is no second term agenda. Well, what policies did Mr. Biden come out with last week in that convention? If you have, if you have a look at the platform, I did. Okay, there is enough there for anyone wanting the federal government to be active, particularly on COVID, particularly in some of the the great areas of climate change and health and so on and so forth. I think Biden will uh, uh, argue the case for a change and argue the case for a certain civility to return to their policy. Now, the problem that Trump has, it's an interesting contrast. Uh, a, a fellow from The New Yorker was, was talking the other day about the two candidates. He said, look, the thing you have to remember about Donald Trump is he's covered from mud head to foot. So he throws something at him, it doesn't matter. He said, you know, yep. a stain on Donald Trump's character is an oxymoron, which is a, an expression I've now appropriated. Uh, I can't say who it was because it was a, an, an off-record uh, discussion. He said, with Joe Biden, he's essentially someone who's very likable and everybody says that. And Trump has been throwing, shall we say, stuff at the former vice president for some time, and none of it has stuck. And it may be that none of it does stick because you, last poll I saw, 61% of Americans said they found the vice president likable. I'm watching Fox News the other day, and one of their senior correspondents talked about what lovely people Joe and Jill Biden happen to be. So you have a circumstance like that. It alters the nature of the, uh, uh, of the debate. Is there going to be a cut-through moment? I suspect the cut-through moment is more likely to come from Biden than Trump. Yeah, look... Because it is a referendum on the Trump administration. There's no doubt about that. Well, my take from last week, the um, Democrat convention, was it was very, very focused on breaking down Trump. It, there were, I didn't see a lot of policies. So, you know, I didn't see... I saw a bit about, as you say, the health. I didn't see a lot. Everyone went after the, Trump. The, right? that, that's the, the message. The conventions are rarely about policy, even in... Even in 32 in, in Chicago, the Democrats in the height of the Great Depression yep. did not focus as much uh, uh, on policy as they did about okay. getting rid of Herbert Hoover. So you have that as a benchmark. I think that's the first time a presidential candidate's addressed the convention accepted the nomination, by the way, yes. FDR, in 32. The simple fact of the, uh, the matter is an incumbent president, doesn't matter whether it's Jimmy Carter or George Bush or whoever, has got to be answerable. It's got to be accountable. And there's lots of shots in the locker about the last four years. What I'm trying to understand is if I go to vote, what am I actually voting for? So I'm going to be looking very much towards this debate because I haven't heard Mr. Biden's policies. Well, you'll hear a bit about policy, but you'll hear a lot of uh, cut and, and thrust and you'll wait for the, uh, uh, for the, the zinger moment. The best one, of course, was Ronald Reagan against Walter Mondale, where age was a factor. Yes, and he flipped it on him. And he said, I will not let my opponent's youth and inexperience become issues in this campaign. Issue disappeared. And Reagan was probably the best in living memory in taking a, a, an issue and upending it with humour. I, I remember once in the 1980 campaign against Jimmy Carter, uh, a Carter White House charged that uh, Governor Reagan had no experience in negotiating with communists. How on earth could he negotiate strategic arms limitation with the Soviets? Which was something of an issue at the time. So the very next press conference the Reagan campaign held, one of the travelling media dutifully asked, uh, you know, Governor of the Carter White House is charged. You have no experience in negotiating with communists. Is this fair, sir? And Reagan is up at the lectern and he dropped his head to one side the way he routinely did and said, no, as governor, I've been obliged on many an occasion to negotiate with the city of Santa Monica. Now, the entire press gallery burst into laughter yeah. and that was the end of the issue. And Reagan could do that uh, superbly well. Better than uh, most. 
Better, better than most. Yep. Franklin Roosevelt was very uh, good. If you ever read the press conference he did when he announced he was sending Harry Hopkins to London to see Winston Churchill in 1940, it is an absolute gem. And you know, the press could hardly keep asking questions for the laughter. So, you know, very effective campaigners can do that. Which brings the art of the communicator. And Reagan was probably the best. We've already realized that Trump, good. We've realized Trump is not presidential. He's not a politician. He's a businessman. And he conveys well, his message. There's some doubt about that too. And, okay, there's some doubt about that. But he conveys his message in common terms or in very simple terms. I mean, I like Michael Bloomberg's answer. When he well, was how did running, Bloomberg go? He was running, <laughs> running the Democratic <laughs> primary. And one of the media said to him, Mr. Mayor, uh, what does it say about America? There are two billionaires running for president. And Bloomberg said, who's the other one? <laughs> Which I thought was a gem of a response, a gem of a response. Great response. And that was designed to, to hit one person only, and that was Trump, yep. of course. How, when he's not reading the cue card or the teleprompter, whatever you wish to call it, how is Mr. Biden going to go? I think go? you underestimate the former vice president. I really do. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily underestimate. I'm very interested in based on what I've been watching. Yeah, mean, I think uh, I think he'll be focused. He'll be disciplined. The, the, the last campaigns on uh, on the Democratic presidential primaries, he did well. There's no question about that. He did well. All right, Stephen. Let's go back to um, the fact that what is he? 78. So he's going to have one term. Therefore, in people's minds, from both sides, I guess we're going to figure out or follow closely the vice presidents. Can you talk us through, I don't know much about Mr. Pence. I do follow it. I do watch what you say, the US TV. I've been watching closely with Kamala Harris. She's also on the progressive side, very much so. Um, what do you know about those two? The, um, the current vice president is the link to the evangelicals and the Republican yeah, okay. coalition, a former congressman, a former governor of, of Indiana. He's been uh, stoic in his defense of uh, Trump. He's um, deeply uh, uh, religious. He works on the uh, basis, for example, that um, he doesn't go out to dinner with female staffers. There's a bar on that. Right. So there can be no suggestion of impropriety. He's handled himself pretty well. Mm. And uh, he's obviously looking to the, uh, to the future, and he'd be one who's considered... A, uh, a potential Republican nominee for president, okay. along with Nikki Haley, possibly Mike Pompeo, possibly yep. one of the prominent uh, senators such as Marco Rubio. Rubio. Oh, yeah. So I don't think he brings uh, great baggage to the uh, contest. He brings uh, some uh, some pluses in terms of the voting constituency for the uh, Republicans. Uh, Kamala Harris a former prosecutor of San Francisco, former California Attorney General, yep. United States Senator for California. Yes, she tends to the left of the party, but she's Californian Democrat. So to win office, statewide office, that really is your uh, uh, positioning of choice. She didn't do well in the primaries. Now, what was your take on her? She, I thought she uh, went too hard on the race issues far too early. She did and too, yeah, and right. yeah. on the busing issue with the vice president, uh, for example, I don't think that earned her any friends anywhere. It's all right to knock the front runner out of the way in a, a primary contest. Uh, it's not uh, welcomed within the party to try and destroy the front runner on national uh, television. She's learned from that. Uh, and uh, and Joe Biden, I think, has shown some character in saying, well, that was during the primaries, you know, the altercation. It's all forgotten and forgiven. She is clearly the best on offer in the, the group of uh, women who were prepared to accept the vice presidential nomination. Um, okay. I thought Amy Klobuchar was was yeah. was very very good in the primaries. She was close to John McCain, and she's another who might have been considered. But being from Minnesota and given what had happened in Minneapolis, that tended to rule uh, to rule her out. So I think the vice president chose uh, cho vice president Biden chose well. I think Senator Harris will be very good on the campaign, 
it won't be an easy campaign. I think this will be a very rough campaign. Uh, a lot of it being thrown by the current president. No way around it. A lot of the muck will be thrown by the current president. Are tactics going to be much different to previous elections? I think it'll be a case of doubling down on the Republican campaign of 2016. And if you look at the... You, you, you take one or two of the speeches. Take uh, Kimberly Guilfoyle's speech, for yeah, example. Yeah. You would think that the Democrats are actually Hun warriors <laughs> about to arrive in your suburb. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I find it laughable, but the same as I find a fellow from Montana boasting about five guns in every household. But, you know, for a certain part of the electorate, and bear in mind, in a voluntary voting system, you've got to mobilise your vote and you've got to depress your opponents. And the way you do that, it's through negative campaigning. Yeah. I expect the turnout to be fairly high, up towards 60%. And so mobilisation is the key to success. What's enthusiasm then? Uh, there's, isn't there this metric at the moment? They're both talking the the enthusiasm levels for the, yeah, uh, so the electorate? Yeah, but that's like Australian politicians who are behind talking about how well they're doing in marginal seats. I mean, if you haven't got the numbers overall, you look for a metric that suggests you are doing well. I have no doubt that the Trump uh, coalition is – uh, enthusiastic about him being returned and very negative about some aspects of the Democratic Party and about the, the candidates. In Christopher Buckley's uh, book, Make Russia Great Again, he refers to his opponents as loser one and loser two. Now, that would surprise me if that actually surfaced during the campaign, <laughs> which is Buckley's genius. He's just twisting reality half a notch. Simple fact of the, uh, the matter is mobilization is going to matter. And this election is going to be won or lost in the, in the great suburbs of Miami and uh, Philadelphia and, uh, and Madison. Well, just on that, the lobbyists, the influence and the role of the lobbyists and organisations like the NRA. Well, the National Rifle Association is bedrock for the Republican Party. There's no question uh, uh, about that. Uh, but on the other side of the, uh, uh, of the coin, there are a lot of people who are extremely critical of the NRA and, and yep. will turn yep. out. So the turnout for Trump is is going to be a factor, but the turnout to evict Trump from the White House, I suspect, is a greater factor. If I'm an American, have I lost sight or lost faith in the American dream? No. No need to. I mean, there, there are some areas that cry out for, uh, for address. Living wages is one. Uh, in the uh, in the sense that um, if you're working in a diner, you're being paid something like two dollars fifty an hour plus tips, and that hasn't changed in about three decades. Now, I would be highly critical of the Democrats over uh, uh, over that, particularly if you look at the record of Lyndon Johnson as majority leader in the United States Senate in increasing the American uh, uh, minimum wage. He was he was outstanding. It's really important that issues like that come to the fore because you have a an American working class doing unskilled and semi-skilled work that's very poorly paid and you have an underclass that can't make it in. To lose sight of the dream, you've got to open some doors and you've got to smooth the uh, way or otherwise it becomes a reality. I don't think it should be because there is a good deal of upward uh, uh, mobility even now and, uh, and people can, particularly through education, step up and, uh, and step out. But the simple fact of the, uh, uh, the matter is there are some issues crying out, particularly given that uh, health insurance is related to employment. Stephen, on the international stage, you, you made some comments early on, but I, I think it's worth noting that Trump has made some big decisions in foreign policy dealing with ISIS, addressing Syria and Iran, including revisiting the Iran nuclear agreement, recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital, presenting the new Afghan strategy, and again on nuclear weapons, he's dealt with North Korea. How has he dealt with North Korea? Trump's the first sitting US president to set foot in North Korea. They haven't had any nuclear testing in three years. Yeah, but they turned their missile testing program off for a while. It's no, nothing permanent in yeah, there. Yeah, okay, all right. But... And also, I would like and to also, think it also, is. And also with China. He's engaged with China. He's introduced tariffs. He got the agreement earlier this year, phase one of the trade agreement. 
He's been vocal in regards to the intellectual property, protecting American interests, and the broader concerns around the Belt and Road Initiative, and in our neck of the woods, the South China Sea. He's bringing manufacturing back to the US. He's creating jobs and providing national security. So who's the better leader on the international front? Well, unquestionably Biden, unquestionably. How, I mean, how, how, do you, how, how, do you, how on earth can you say North Korea has been a success? How on earth can anyone claim given what's been happening in the East China Sea with respect to the Zenkakas and the Dyers on the Taiwan Strait, in the South China Sea, the militarization of, of the islands and so on, that Trump foreign policy has been a success. But Obama's foreign policy didn't do anything about it. But Trump is in the White House now. Yes, but is he not bringing it to the attention of the world, the need for free and open Indo-Pacific, in response to no action from Obama? I think the one thing that Trumpeteers have to realise is they're not voting on Obama. That judgment's been passed. This is a, a, a vote on Trump. He's very comfortable with people like Vladimir Putin, for example. In the, the weeks before, the current Russian government had the leader of the opposition poisoned. Trump was arguing to bring Putin back into the G8. And the Allies said no, particularly the Germans, the French, the Brits, and a good decision. Simple fact of the matter is Trump foreign policy is transactional. It's all about looking at whether or not the US runs a trade surplus or a trade deficit with different countries and starting from there. I don't think there is effectively a Trump foreign policy, which is overarching. What drives the Trump foreign policy? We knew what was driving US presidents basically all the way through to Trump. And was Obama a success everywhere in foreign policy? No, absolutely not. Nor George W. Bush. But at least it was coherent. You knew what you were dealing with. What is Biden's policy going? We don't. Well, we still don't know yet. Well, but is I, he seriously going to be good enough to engage with and match the? I Chinese? think, given his experience on the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee, given his seriousness as Vice President, given the links that he has around the world. I think it'll work reasonably well. Now, let's go to hinge mm -hmm. on who comes into his administration. And s someone who yeah, was true, important true, true. Yep. at the Democratic National Convention was General Colin Powell, who openly endorsed Joe Biden. And I think as a military man, as a diplomat, as a presidential advisor, Colin Powell has an outstanding record. So if, I think judgments if, like that matter. Oh, for sure. I'm not disagreeing with that. If Mr. Biden did win, how does he choose his team to, to come on board? And how do they get compensated? I've always wondered about that. Well, compensation's not an issue. You don't serve in the US government for the money. Is it for is it you for the nominal a dollar per annum? Is that is that no, still true no, no, or not? They're, they're, no, you can you can choose to do it that way. Yeah, okay. You can choose to do it that way, be paid uh, a dollar and so on and uh, and so forth. But generally there's a uh, there's remuneration linked to the office, but it's not uh, it's, it's not excessive. It's not overly generous. Simple fact of the matter is there are all kinds of pressures on a president to respond to the party, to respond to the different constituencies, and to look for the expertise. From an Australian uh, perspective, uh, it's particularly important who is Secretary of State, who is Secretary of Defence, and who has responsibility in trade. The other um, cabinet officers are important, but they're the main ones. Okay. I expect, by the way, I, ex I expect that a Biden administration will have a couple of prominent Republicans in, in it at cabinet level. Any particular names you're thinking about? No, not at the moment. I think they may well emerge, but uh, so, some of the better presidential uh, uh, decisions, for example, uh, Bill Clinton having uh, Senator Bill Cohen as Defence Secretary from the Republican side of the aisle, going back a little bit further, Richard Nixon having uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan as domestic advisor. These were prominent uh, people on the other side of the aisle who, who served well. Stephen, the world's changed. It is fake, changing. We talked about fake news media, but we haven't talked about that's all part of social media now. How big an influence is that going to have? Oh, enormous. That's why both you talk, the I think major you talked, parties... And you talked Twitter initially, didn't you, too? Look, both the, the major parties uh, are campaigning heavily social media at the moment, Facebook and Twitter and so on and and so forth. And it can be successful. It can also be very dangerous. Uh, the Russians probably did this in 2016 through the Internet Research Agency, uh, claiming that the Pope had endorsed Donald Trump. 
And for a while when I heard that, I thought, my God, you know, has the church really gone that far off the cliff? It hadn't, and it was a nonsense. But that actually hit home would, in America, and for a lot of evangelicals, that was permission <laughs> to vote for Trump. This was after the Billy Bush tape and so on, which I won't go into because I think it's extremely offensive. Yep. And uh, you have a circumstance in which I, I think it was Winston Churchill said a lie can be halfway around the world before the truth gets its pants on, and that's true, and social media is the ultimate vehicle. Look, there's always been a form of social media in, uh, in American uh, politics. The newspapers have tended to line up behind candidates and parties. And be and this is, really goes back to about 1793, that the newspapers would come in heavily in support of their preferred candidate. And in large measure, that's uh, still the case, though, you know, the, the more responsible newspapers are, of course, um, uh, factual records as well. You have a circumstance in which pamphlets were once the social media. And uh, in the election of 1800, which is the worst American election, Jefferson uh, against Adams and Colonel Aaron Burr, who was Jefferson's running mate, tried to steal the election outright. The alternative charges were treason and murder. So we've come back just to half. Mind you, let's wait till November 4 on this one. <laughs> we've tended to come back half a step. I'm waiting for the next Kimberly Guilfoyle speech here. The simple fact of the matter is there's always been social media and there's always been media commentary and there's always been partisanship in their elections, as there is to an extent in ours. Influence of Israel? I think the Trump administration deserves marks for what's happened between Israel and the uh, and the Gulf states. Are you impressed by that? Blue a pencil tick there. I don't know that... Um, Israel figures prominently in this uh, election. The Jewish communities in the United States tend to be pretty much fixed in their views one way or the other. Mm -hmm. a, a friend of mine, a Jewish American, said that he didn't think the Gulf states' decision would have any impact in the United States presidential contest uh, at all. He thought Jewish voters had made up their minds a long time ago, one way or the other. Where does the red and blue come from? Uh, well, you couldn't really tag the Democratic Party, the Red Party, given the history of McCarthyism. So they agreed tacitly, red and blue states. And it, it's it's relatively recent, unlike uh, uh, donkeys and, and elephants as, as symbols. Yes. But that's simply simply to be fair to both sides, red and blue. There's no symbolism behind that? Look, it, it, it's 19th century. And uh, it's a, a magazine that uh, tagged the the parties at the time. I don't think it has anything uh, anything uh, of consequence beyond just being um, a part of their political culture. You're obviously an avid student of U.S. history. Is this the most important election in your time? Look, every election is important. There's no uh, uh, question about that. For the future of the US and the future of the planet, this is the most important election I've seen. Yes. Oh, I'd be silly if I didn't ask the question, Stephen. Who's going to win? I think Biden wins. Not a lot in it, but I think Biden wins. Stephen, I look forward to continuing and concluding our discussion after the election and analysing where it was won and what it means for Australia and the world. You've been listening to No Limitations. <laughs>